there, it's Pete here, and today I wanted to teach you how to bid Grand Slams. So I wanted to go over my general approach, what I actually consider. I also wanted to talk about how good do Grand Slams need to be before you try and bid them. And then I wanted to cover a few conventions that I think are useful. I'm not going to go overly in depth in them, uh, but if you're interested in more information in them, uh, check the links below. So first of all, how good does a Grand Slam need to be before you actually want to be in it? So uh, this actually varies depending on vulnerability and scoring method. Uh, there's two scoring methods, match points and imps. Um, and it also varies if you're vulnerable at imps or not vulnerable at imps, the uh, team scoring. Match points is usually the pair score. So uh, basically for a Grand Slam, what you really want it to be is roughly about 75% to make. Um, there's no absolute precise number because what you actually have to think about is what, what are you comparing against? So uh, if the opponents are just going to be in slam and we work on that assumption, um, if it's vulnerable and imps, if, if your opponents are gonna be in slam, you're actually gonna win 13 imps if you bid a grand slam and make it, but you lose 17 if you go down. And what this equates to is basically you need to be making it about 60% of the time to be breaking even there. The issue is your opponents aren't always in slam. Uh, sometimes they might just be in a game contract. And now if you just bid a small slam, you're already picking up like 13. And by bidding Grand Slam, you're trying to get an extra four imps, but you're risky losing not only those 13 imps you already had in the bank, but 13 more for going down and losing a game swing there. Uh, so you're risking 26 imps to pick up another four. So if you think there's a chance your opponents might only be in a game contract, you want to be up around 90% sure that Grand Slam's making. Uh, now, it's always impossible to know what your opponents are doing. So I pick somewhere in the middle. Uh, so for me, it's around 75%. But if the field you're playing in is really, really good, then that'll creep closer to 60%. Or if it's a weaker field, then you want to be closer towards the 90%. If it's match points, uh, the pair scoring, it actually is like 50-50. If everyone's in slam, you want it to be 50-50 to be bidding it. Or uh, you're at actually 0% improvement if the opponents are just going to be in a game contract. So again, that 75% mark's about right. So let's now like just jump in and look at a, a hand or two. And then I wanted to talk about my general approach. So here, my question to you is, what do you actually bid after this auction? So partners preempted three spades, bid four no trumps, Roman key card, and they've bid uh, five spades showing two with the queen. So what do you actually want to bid and why? While you think about that, I'll actually uh, go over my general approach. So the first thing that I like to do when considering uh, bidding a Grand Slam is there are like two main pathways to bidding Grand Slams. Uh, one which is commonly taught, which is you just need 37 points to bid a Grand Slam. Now this happens extraordinarily rarely. And this is why many people don't bid Grand Slams. But there is another way that you can do this, and this is hand visualization which is I imagine what partner's hand could be like. And then I think, can I count 13 tricks? What do I know about their hand? Can I get to all 13? Because if we can get 13 tricks, great. We can bid a Grand Slam. So uh, this is my main approach for trying to bid Grand Slams. You know, what I like to do for hand visualization is look at what I know already from the bidding and then just sort of plan the play a little bit. Uh, if we're planning on being in a suit contract, can we trump our losers, dump them? What can we actually do? Now, if we use this as an example, partners preempted three spades, so they look like they've got seven spades, and then they showed us uh, two with the queen. Uh, so here, what I would be looking at is, well, we've got uh, all the key cards, so it looks like partners got ace, king, queen of spades. They're not gonna have much else. Uh, so it looks like we've got seven spade tricks as my jack fleshes that out. We probably don't need the jack for me to bid this reasonably comfortably anyway. Uh, but uh, we've got seven spade tricks. And then we've got the ace king of hearts for nine, the ace of clubs for 10, and ace king queen of diamonds. We've got 13 tricks. So we should be bidding grand slam. Uh, importantly, we want to be bidding seven no trumps uh, because we don't need to do any trumping here. Uh, <laughs> So while we have a fit, you, 
always want to keep no trumps in mind, especially when playing match points, because that extra 10 points would be really critical. But notice here, I planned a hand where we got 13 tricks, and I didn't say I needed to do any trumping. If you get to 13 tricks by saying I can trump these losers, that's different. We want to play in a suit contract there. Uh, if you can just count 13 tricks without that, try no trumps. So here, uh, as you can see, we've got seven spade winners. The opponents only have four. We've got the ace, king of hearts, the ace of clubs, and ace, king, queen of diamonds. You could see that partner's got three low clubs, but we can throw one on a diamond and one on a heart. And we've actually got 13 pretty comfortable uh, tricks there. So we can actually make all 13. Uh, so next I wanted to talk about a few different conventions that I like to use to actually help me get to Grand Slams. And these all are about improving your hand visualization by telling you something specific about their hand. So the conventions that I like using, uh, Roman Keycard, I'm sure most of you already play that, but this is a great tool for locating specifically what partner's key cards actually are. And also the Queen of Trumps, which can be very useful for bidding grand slams. Number two is a follow on to that, which is using five no trumps to be a specific king ask. So you can, after you use Roman key card, you can bid five no trumps to say partner, can you bid specifically where you have a king? The third one is Q bidding. I love using uh, bids after we've bid and agreed a suit that are above three of a major typically to say I've got first or second round control. This can help you identify where partners kings are or singletons. It's a very flexible tool and a great slam bidding tool in general. And the final one is splinters where you show support and singletons at the same time and highlight, do we have any wasted values there? So of those four conventions, all of them are good for bidding small slams, except for the specific king ask, which is basically just for uh, bidding grand slams. Uh, so they're really, really useful. They help you paint a picture and do good hand visualization. Techniques that I have for trying to visualize partner's hand is given the pitting, what do I already know about their hand already? And if there's a range that they can have, what I like to do is visualize a hand that would be a perfect minimum hand given what points they've shown. Like I might not know what aces they've got or kings they've got, but I do know they've got 12 or more points or 16 or more points or whatever they've actually shown. Now, if I can come up with a hand at the bottom range of what they've actually got that can make small slam or grand slam, where I think about what if they've got a shortage here or honors there, uh, then I will investigate it. It doesn't mean that I'll bid it, but I'll investigate it because if you can come up with the perfect minimum hand, then what you can actually do is have lots of imperfect maximum hands that will also work. You're not going to think of every hand, but if you can think of some hands that are at the bottom of their range, you'll actually give yourself lots of freedom for finding uh, the right cards, the perfect cards to help you uh, bid these small slams or imperfect cards that also help you. Whereas if you're thinking at the absolute top of their range, uh, then there's not as much wiggle room there and that they're often harder to bid. So again, the tips are visualize specific cards that they can actually have or specific shapes that you can have. And then you have a rough idea of the play and think, what can I do with my losers or how many winners can I get? So let's look at another example of this. So let's say that we open this one, one spade and partner bids four diamonds splinter. So what a splinter shows is it usually shows four card support and in the range of about 10 to 14 high card points and a singleton or void in the suit they've bid. So here we know they've got a singleton diamond, usually four card support and about 10 plus high card points. So, well, what losers do we have? What, what can we do? Well, we can visualize that partner's got a singleton diamond. They've told us that, so there's no doubts there. So we can just trump these two diamonds, right? So we've got no diamond losers there. We've got an issue in clubs. What if partner's got the ace of clubs? Well, then that's fine. And hearts, we've got a loser. What if partner's got a loser, that, uh, the ace there? Again, no more losers. So here, a perfect minimum hand partner could have is the ace of hearts, the ace of clubs, and a singleton diamond. In fact, this is a sub minimum hand. Partner's shown more points than that. Uh, so here, if they've got two aces, including a singleton diamond, we know about the singleton diamond. 
and we know how we can ask for aces, I'd go straight into four no trumps. And then here, when partner says they've got two key cards without the queen, we've got all the key cards, they have those two aces. We do need to do trumping. So here we can jump to seven spades. And then on this hand, we can see that we have no heart losers, we have no club losers, we can trump those diamonds. So by using this hand visualization technique, it can really help you bid small slams and grand slams. And as you can see here, partner's queen of hearts, that wasn't even useful. The jack of spades wasn't even needed either. It helped flesh things out, it would make it nice and safe, uh, but not needed at all. Uh, so let's bring up another hand. All right, so in this one, uh, we've got this nice hand with 15 points, partner opened a spade, and we bid two no trumps. This here I was just pretending was Jacoby two no trumps, where we'd shown game forcing strength hand and four or more spades. And here, partner's response, three no trumps said, I don't have a shortage, but I'm not a completely minimum hand. They're not the 12 to 14. So we know they've got a few extra points, and we bid four no trumps, a Roman key card, and here, five diamonds was zero or three. You can play Roman key card, either zero, three, one, four, or 14, 30. My general preference is 14, 30, they both work. Um, but here, what should we do after this? So again, we wanna do hand visualization. We think partners around about 15 points. Um, they could have more than that. And here, we know that they've got three aces because if partner's got 15 points and we've got 15, uh, there's not room to be missing three key cards here. So partner's got the three aces, uh, which is great. So here we can see that we've got uh, like an issue in hearts, an issue, that no issues in clubs because we've got that covered and we've got an issue in diamonds. Here, it might be a bit dicey that like if the opponent's leader heart and the diamond finesse fails or something, then we might go down and slam, but slam's still a good bet. Now we want to be bidding a small slam at least. Should we bid grand slam? Can you see anything that would help us get there? So this is where hand visualization comes in. So I think, well, if partner's got 15 points, what's the perfect hand they could have? Well, we know they've got three aces. What I would really like them to have is the king of diamonds. If they've got the king of diamonds, then we can see that we can actually take five diamond tricks, five spade tricks, the ace of hearts, and the ace king of clubs for 13. Whereas if partner had the king of hearts instead, now we can't take 13 tricks. Uh, like you, it would be on a finesse, but we can't count 13 tricks. So this is why if you use five no trumps as how many kings you've got, it won't help you in this specific spot. So if we'd bid five no trumps uh, saying, uh, we've got all the key cards, tell me where you've got a king and you play specific king ask, partner could bid six diamonds if they've got the king of diamonds. And now we can count 13 tricks, five spades, five diamonds, two clubs and a heart for 13. Now, again, I didn't mention trumping in here. So which one should we bid? We should bid seven no trumps here. So here's a hand where we can uh, bid Grand Slam and see that we have 13 tricks. The important point here is can you count 13 tricks? Can you visualize a perfect minimum and partner can have? And then can you actually investigate it? Some of the tools that you can use here are Roman key cards, specific king ask, cue bidding, or splinters. And if we don't need to do trumping, you wanna keep keep no trumps in mind because seven no trumps can often be a bit safer and prevent like suffering a diamond rough on the opening lead or anything. So uh, they're the tools that I like to use. I just wanted to f finish off by saying uh, what my general slam bidding plan is. What you like to do in the early stages for slam bidding is you want to set up forcing options and you want to tell partner what trumps are. So perfect ways of doing this are bids like uh, two no trump Jacoby or two over one game force or opening two clubs, game forcing strength hands. Uh, importantly, you want to know how do you show your strong raises for support for partner. You don't want to just rush into things because you want to be able to explore information. So discuss with your partner, what's your raise structure? What's your strongest raise? Because not only do you want to set up forcing auctions, you also want to tell partner what trumps is. And this two no trump bid works great for actually doing both. After I've done that and I have an idea of how many points partners got or a bit about their shape, 
what I like to do is visualize their hand and think, where are our losers? Where would I ideally want to see their cards? And uh, can I plan the play? And if you can do that, uh, you want to think, well, can I get 13 tricks? And then once you've done that, if you can come up with the perfect minimum hand that can make slam or grand slam, look at what tools you've got and can you find a way that you definitely want to be there. Anyway, they're my tips for how to bid Grand Slam. Thanks all for watching and we'll see you next time.